This video is called The War of 1812, and this is going to be about a second war with England. And because it's a second war with England, not far after the Revolutionary War, many people refer to this war as the Second Revolutionary War. So let's see how we got to fight with England a second time. So it all begins with a guy named James Madison. You might remember him from the Constitutional Convention. He was the guy who was nicknamed the father of the Constitution, the one who got the whole convention organized and basically proposed the Virginia Plan at the Constitutional Convention. Well, he takes over for Thomas Jefferson when Thomas Jefferson retires in 1809. And when Madison is president, he inherits this problem with England that has been a problem for Washington, Jefferson Adams, and now Madison. Britain is still impressing American trade ships. Even after multiple treaties, like the Treaty, the Jay Treaty and other treaties, like the Treaty of Paris, Britain is still ignoring those treaties in arming Native Americans in the Northwest Territory. So settlers in the West are being attacked by Native Americans that have guns because England's giving them guns. This is making people in the South and West extremely angry. The North, even though they probably should be mad because they're the ones that do the trading, they still depend on England for so much of their money that they're willing to deal with a little bit of England being a bully. But the South and the West, they are really, really mad at England. On top of the regular people being very mad, a new group of people in Congress called Warhawks emerges. These Warhawks are an interesting group. They, it all starts when there's 63 new members of Congress in 1810. If you think about a, a Congress that's like 180 or so people, and all of a sudden you have 63 new faces. That's an incredible amount. One third of the Congress is brand new. These are young people. They're replacing congressional leaders who have been around for a long time. These new young people that are in Congress, they want to have their own success, and they want to have their own stories to tell, like their fathers who were in the Revolutionary War. This new group of young people also have a tremendous sense of nationalism, which is pride in their country. So you combine this kind of young politicians who want to make a name for themselves with this pride in their country. They really hate that Britain isn't respecting the United States. That all kind of comes together and these people are starting to call for war with England, and that's why they're called the Warhawks. Two of the famous Warhawks were Henry Clay and John Calhoun. And the Warhawks kind of get everyone on board that war with England is a good idea, except for in New England, in the north, where opposition to the war is strong. In the rest of the country, these Warhawks are able to sort of push the idea of war, and the United States declares war on England in 1812. So what happens when this war begins Eng um, America and these war hawks, in addition to you know, having nationalism, they also want to expand. They're interested in the British territory of Canada, and they think that they can take that and make the United States bigger. England is still at war with France and Napoleon, so this is almost a perfect time for the United States to try and swoop in while England is distracted with another country and take over. However, it may have been the perfect time, because England was busy, but Due to Jefferson being president and him cutting the army back so far when he took over, America's army was strong, was really not very strong, and it was really, really weak and small, and it wasn't really ready for a war. So this invasion, which I'll show you here, did not go so well. So the United States planned to invade Canada from Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan area, area and their invasion failed, even though they had a superior force. England was able to stop the invasion, and for the rest of the war in this area, basically nothing happens. Nothing good for the United States, at least. So America's main goal in this war to take over Canada is a failure, and that's why many people say that the United States loses the War of 1812. Despite this major failure in the war, there are some successes. There was a, a famous battle on Lake Erie, which is depicted in this photo here, where a man named Oliver Hazard Perry actually loses his ship, gets in a rowboat, goes over to another ship, gets on and commands a, another ship and wins the battle. So it's kind of a story of success and perseverance. Uh, a famous battle on, in the Atlantic Ocean was won by a ship called the USS Constitution. And the story is it's a, it's a wooden boat, but it was built so well out of American factories that 
all the English cannonballs would just fall off the sides of the boat and it wouldn't go through, so they called the boat Old Ironsides. Another major victory for the United States was in the South, with General Andrew Jackson defeating many of the Creek Indians who were fighting on the side of England and opening up millions of acres of settlement when he moves the Creeks out. Jackson will do very well in this war and make a name for himself to become president later on. One of the major things that happens in this war is that once England defeats France and is able to focus everything on the United States, they have an invading force that enters Washington, D.C., and they burn the United States capital city to the ground. Actually, a funny story is that President Madison is entertaining guests at the White House when England starts the invasion, so he has to flee the city. He's carrying like the, Declara the Declaration of Independence and other treasures with him as he's running out of the city. But all the food was cooked and served on the table, so when England marches up to the White House, they see it's empty, and they walk in and they eat Madison's dinner. Then they burn the entire city to the ground. So this was a humiliating thing for the United States. England was able to capture the capital city and burn it to the ground. However, a good thing happened after that. England moved up the harbor into Baltimore after taking Washington, D.C., and they tried to capture Baltimore. But in an epic battle at Fort McHenry, the United States was able to stop England's invasion, and England did not take Baltimore. During this fight, this is when the Star Spangled Banner was written by Francis Scott Key. Key was a prisoner on board the ship, one of the English ships that was in the harbor, and he recorded the battle and wrote the Star Spangled Banner during this battle at Fort McHenry, which we will see when we're on our way back from Washington, D.C., back to Ellington, the last day of our trip. Another interesting thing that came out of this war was called the Hartford Convention. Like I said before, New England states really did not like this war at all. They, they hated it, and as the war went on and they suffered, their pocketbooks suffered because they weren't able to make any money, they wanted the war to end. So one thing that happened in Hartford, a little state history, was something called the Hartford Convention. The northern states that were hurt by war decided they were going to try and leave the country. They were going to secede like the South did in the Civil War. And they met at the Hartford Convention to talk about their options. Luckily, the war ends before the Hartford Convention actually does secede, and, and the New England states did, did not secede because the war ended before they had a chance to. But they were talking about it at the Hartford Convention. It's pretty interesting that a lot of people only think that the only time there was possible se secession was during the Civil War, but during the War of 1812, the North actually after almost seceded from the country. So the last part of this story, it, the war ends in 1814 with the Treaty of Ghent. Basically, there's really not a clear winner in this war. But the interesting thing about wars back then is, what it, is that it took so long for information to come back from Europe. So before the, the word returned to the United States that the war was over, Andrew Jackson again wins a famous battle called the Battle of New Orleans. This Battle of New Orleans didn't really matter because the war was already over, but it really boosted the pride of the United States that they were able to defeat England in, in this decisive battle, and it makes Andrew Jackson a hero, and it's that hero status that he uses to become a president later on. So what do we get out of this war? Who won, question mark? That's a good question. Depends on who you ask. Some people will say the United States won because they were sort of the underdog and were able to hold their own. Some people say the United States lost, they were not able to invade Canada, and England burned Washington, D.C. to the ground. There was definitely not a clear winner on either side. You could guess, I guess you could say it was kind of a tie. The Second Revolution, however, officially stops English bullying. The United States finally stands up to England. No more ignoring impressment, no more ignoring England getting involved in the West with Native Americans. This war ends all of that, and the United States is finally asserting itself and standing up for itself. After this, the United States starts to stand up for itself, not just with England, but with the rest of the world as well. And we'll get into that a little bit more in our next unit. And the main thing that, that comes out of the War of 1812 is a great pride, knowing that the United States can stand up to a country like England. That is it for the War of 1812, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the important parts of this in class tomorrow. So we'll see you then.